non-identical Nietzsche and Adorno on the ethics of thinking. In 2014, he published his book on affirmation and becoming, a delusion introduction to Nietzsche's ethics and ontology under the Cambridge Scholars Publishing, United Kingdom. Currently, he is engaged in three book projects, thought pieces, Nietzschean reflections on anti-foundationalism, ethics, and emancipation, on philosophical praxis and language, locating the intersection between Nietzsche and Adorno, and philosophical anthropology, a resource book with introductions, commentaries, and primary readings. Dr. Bolanius also holds today other positions and affiliations in the university through the following. He is currently the program lead for the graduate studies in philosophy. He is a research associate in UST's Research Center for Culture, Arts, and Humanities. He is the founding and incumbent editor-in-chief of Critique, an online journal of philosophy, the official open access journal of the Department of Philosophy established in 2007. Dr. Bolanius also serves as a board member of the Philosophical Association of the Philippines and is also a member today, a member of the prestigious Philippine Academy of Philosophical Research. His area of specializations include the following, Philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche, Theodor Adorno, Critical Theory, and Social and Political Philosophy. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Paolo Bulanas. Maraming salamat Ian for the generous introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for um, staying. Um, this is of course the last uh, talk for uh, this, uh, this, after, this evening or to, uh, today or uh, for, the, for the conference. Um, and I'm also very grateful that uh, our dean is here to listen to me. Um, the title uh, of the presentation that I will share with you this afternoon or this evening is Adorno and the Dialectics of Violence. Uh, like uh, most papers that I've heard, this is also a work in progress. Uh, and so um, I'm, going, I'm simply going to present to you uh, snippets of, of my reflections on violence coming from, uh, ado from a more or less Adornoian context. So I'm going to uh, uh, draw some insights from Adorno and, uh, and other philosophers. Um, and uh, consider this not as a systematic paper or presentation, but more of an invitation for us to reflect on or think about critically uh, uh, about the notion, think, of, think about the notion of violence or the reality of violence. Let me begin by um, quoting Zizek. Uh, from his uh, latest uh, book called the Car I don't know if it's the latest. He churns out books every month. I, I think I don't know when this came out, but uh, it's one of his latest books, The Courage of Hopelessness. This is, by the way, the book where he mentioned Duterte. Uh, Slavoj Zizek says, "A quote like the ways of God, the paths of ideology are mysterious." Now, um, I'd like to begin by. Uh, providing or sharing with you a working definition of what I think is critical theory. And I'm going to do this by um, uh, mentioning three normative claims uh, of critical theory borrowing from Max Horkheimer. And uh, these insights come from his book, it's actually a collection of essays called Critical Theory. Okay? Uh, and um, uh, that book is far, power part of that book rather is his inaugural lecture when he became the director of the Institute for Social Studies uh, But he also has other essays there included. 
But uh, from that book, we can gather three insights that more or less define, or more or less help us define, help me define what critical theory is. <clears throat> and I refer to these as the normative claims of critical theory. And I'm doing this just so we have a working definition, we have a working idea of what critical theory is. But of course, having heard papers from uh, uh, very uh, competent uh, scholars in this past two days, uh, I'm pretty sure that you already have a, an idea of what critical theory is. <clears throat> the first normative claim that we gather from Horkheimer is that critical theory is a discourse that is normatively based on human affairs. So basically, um, we can also refer to this as uh, the anthropological shift See? <laughs> they provided. <laughs> All right. Uh, is that okay or the, uh, the previous fight was better? Is this all right? Yes. Uh, All right, so the anthropological shift in critical theory, I argue, brings back democratic discourse to the people who constitute society. I have, uh, uh, and the, uh, so in other words, uh, the, dis uh, the discourse is a discourse that is normatively grounded in human affairs. That's why I refer to it as the anthropological shift. Um, the second, uh, so in other words, uh, one one argument that we can we can claim uh, that we can present is that most of our problems are problems of of, of or problems resulting from human affairs, right? and so perhaps the only way to solve these problems or the only way to resolve these problems is by also um, activating normative resources from our own human discourse or discourses what Adorno and other critical views would refer to as immanent critique. The second normative uh, uh, claim of critical theory is that critical theory advocates the abolition of slavery and social injustice. So the, norm, the, the second normative claim is the strongest, the abolition of slavery and social injustice, and one which resonates very well with uh, uh, with all the, all the pronouncements of critical theories. In, in every critical theories, or sorry, in every critical theories, regardless of whether he, he comes from the uh, uh, first generation, second generation, third generation, there's always this strong inclination to advocate for the abolition of slavery and social injustice. The third normative claim of critical theory is that uh, it is a discourse that decentralizes uh, the discourse of emancipation from the proletariat to other social groups. And this can also be referred to as the democratization of emancipation. The early members of the Frankfurt School veered away from Georg Lukács uh, or Georg Lukács' uh, uh, overvalorization of the role of the proletariat in his uh, book called History and Class Consciousness. And they viewed emancipation as a possibility for the greatest number of people or for the other social groups. And they saw the overvalorization of the proletariat class as another form of social elitism that has the potential to exclude other social groups. One way of, 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 one, one way of um, saying this also, or another way of saying this, is that emancipation doesn't only happen in the factory. Emancipation is also possible through other social groups or classes. Um, so uh, these three normative claims will hopefully provide us with a working, a working definition or working idea of what I think is critical theory. Um, now, let me conduct a little experiment with you. Okay? Um, 
I'd like, you, I'd like to get your opinion. What do you see here? It is the the one here who knows uh, the uh, uh, the pair of shoes. Not, uh, or it is the latest Kyrie Irving sneakers from Nike, right? All right. I don't know if it's the latest, but when 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 I downloaded it. Uh, when I downloaded the image, it was the latest. Uh, all right, so what do you think of this image? What do you think of this uh, picture? What does it tell you? Well, it's ex this expensive, of course. It looks expensive. It's shiny and new. Right? It looks expensive. Source of power. Source of power. When you wear it at high rate, you will feel like high rate Irving. So, is it telling you something? Okay? It's expensive. The only thing you can think of is it's, uh, it's, it's expensive, it's shiny and new, and it, it, basically it's associated with Kyrie, but any pair of shoes can be associated with any athlete. It depends on Nike. Nike simply has to impose the logo, and that's it, right? Uh, I'll go back to that image later on. Okay, so we'll move to another slide. We'll move to another image. I'm fond of shoes. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm presenting you um, a picture of a pair of shoes. Actually, several pairs. Here's the new Kyrie Irving sneakers from Nike. I'll show you another pair of shoes. All right. So, what is the uh, what? Wh where did this come from? This image. I know it's from the internet, but uh, <laughs> but basically, it's an electronic copy of anyone. Come on, anyone of the high gear, high gears in here. It's the. We begin with an intro. You ma asal All right. See, you don't get exempted. <laughs> now, of course, it's the painting of Van Gogh, of a pair of peasant shoes. Remember? Yes. yes. This, is, this is a very famous painting. Okay. Um, of course, this is more famous. Okay? When I show, when I show this slide, oh, it's, it's Kyrie Irving, it's the latest Kyrie Irving. When I show you this slide, All right, it's the painting. Uh, it's a pair. It's called a pair of shoes by Van Gogh. Okay, uh, Heidegger, in his uh, uh, the origin of the work of art, used the image to explain how art is able to present or illustrate what the worldhood of or uh, uh, the, the the worldhood basically of peasants. Okay. Um, so, according to Heidegger in the essay, art, it is possible for art to explain or illustrate being. Okay? Um, but compare this slide or this image with this image. What do you say, what can you say about this image? It's new, it's, 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 it's Kyrie, but it's simply Kyrie because that's the, the, the logo is there and the Nike logo swoosh is there, right? But this one is not associated with any athlete or, or any uh, popular celebrity, okay? But when you look at the image, it tells you something about the person who wore it. Is it? Okay, so what does it tell you about the person who wore it? The thing you buy the person is a mall goer who spends his time in the mall. No, the person who wore this pair of shoes was a work a laborer, a worker, someone who worked hard, and it shows in the in the in the image. The uh, it's a worn out pair of shoes. It's not as shiny as this one, not as colorful, colorful as, this, as this one. So basically, it's telling you something about the person who wore it. 
right? That it's telling about the 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 the, the, uh, the conditions that surrounded that person, worldhood of that person. In other words, in that in Heideggerian terms, okay, the being of that person, and the being of the person manifests in labor. Okay. Um, uh, and of course, for those who are writing on Heidegger, being is not a hovering entity. Being is this, according to Heidegger. All right. Like I said, I'm fond of shoes. I'm, I'm going to show you another picture. You know what these are? When the Soviet Union liberated Auschwitz in 1945, they were able they were able to collect 43,000 pairs of shoes in the camp. Okay, and the photo shows you uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the shoes that they were able to collect. Okay, and who wore the shoes? Who owned the shoes? Basically, they were the shoes of the Jews uh, and other people who were put uh, to, uh, uh, who were, you know, who were in, uh, in, the, in the concentration camps and put to death by the Nazis. All right. Uh, in a way, you can say that it's a work of art because it's an installation of uh, remnants from Nazi, from from Auschwitz. Okay. But if I'm going to go back to the first, uh, people got excited when they showed the picture of the, the Kaiser. Okay. Um, but when I ask you, what does the picture tell you? Maybe it's telling you it's expensive. Okay. But gradually I showed you this picture, and then you realize, no, the other picture doesn't tell anything. But that picture tells us something about the life of the peasant who wore the pair of shoes. The being of the peasant, right? But again, when I show showed you this uh, uh, picture of uh, the pair of shoes, the pair of shoes in Auschwitz, uh, based th these are not for sale, like the kairi, the pair of kairi, uh, and it's not a work of art like this. But but. It, it, it provides the strongest story about the people who wore these shoes. Okay. Um, uh, so what, what what can what can this image tell you? All right. So thank you for uh, you know participating in the experiment. <laughs> uh, I've I've I've, exper I've I've used the experiment several times, at least three times. This is the third time I've used it. Every time that I show the pictures, I get the same result. Okay. The first one, oh, they get so excited, especially the younger one. Oh, this is a new fiery, right? Uh, it's a brand new shiny pair of shoes, which you can buy, of course, for seven thousand pesos if, if you want to buy one, uh, one pair. Uh, but it does not it does not tell you anything about Kyrie. It doesn't tell you anything about Kyrie Irving, isn't it? It's not telling you anything. About, Kyrie Irving never wore these shoes. Okay, it's just the logo. And the imposite, the, the, the association with the, with the athlete is simply imposed. It's not real. Okay? And they do that because they want to sell these shoes. Next year, they will come up with a new pair of shoes. Actually, every, I think for one year, they come up with three versions of the same Kyrie or the same LeBron. Right? But this one you don't you don't need to go to you don't need to to, to buy this pair of shoes, but it, 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 you can you can derive something from from from, from the painting. It, it, it's actually telling you a story, right? 
It's telling your story of the hardship of the person who won. This, this picture tells you a, a very strong story. And a real one. Okay. And perhaps it's the most powerful of, of the three images that I showed you. Would you, do you agree? All right. I move to the next section of my presentation, Auschwitz and the end philosophical year. For Adorno, the phenomenon of Auschwitz is a complete failure of culture. This is the complete failure of culture. But we, pre we do pretend, we do live our lives as if it didn't happen. Right? We still keep on, you know, uh, buying our calories. He writes in Metaphysics, Concepts and Pro Concept and Problems, I quote, There can be no one whose organ of experience has not entirely atrophied, for whom the, wor the world after Auschwitz, that is, the world in which Auschwitz was possible, is the same world as it was before. End of quote. Such an event for Adorno has irrevocably changed philosophy. An event like Auschwitz changed philosophy. To some extent, this resonates with what uh, Dr. Hermita mentioned uh, um, yesterday. Auschwitz, as the ultimate expression of the pathologies of modernity, has damaged life promoting, uh, sorry, has damaged life. Okay? So Auschwitz, as the ultimate expression of the pathologies of modernity, has damaged life. Prompting Adorno to write in Christmas, a quote, to write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric. That, that line, of course, is, is loaded. You, know? you don't take that literally. Of course, you can continue writing poetry after Auschwitz. The question is, what is the content of the poem that you're going to write? Okay? To write a poem after Auschwitz is barbaric. Of course, the statement is a, is a hyperbolic. It's a hyperbolic statement. It's, so so uh, it means something more than what it says. Okay? But even if, even if I don't explain it further, you understand what it means. The same, the, the same question could be posed to philosophy. Is philosophy still possible after Auschwitz? Auschwitz, of course, has become a symbol for political and systemic violence. It, 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 uh, such an event changes the way we think about reality, changes the way we, uh, we, we do, uh, do our thing, okay? like philosophy. Can philosophy continue? Can poetry con can, can continue writing poetry after an event like Auschwitz? The possibility of philosophy, the practice of making sense of, of the world through ideas, is questioned, therefore, by, a, by the experience of an event like Auschwitz. Is the discourse of creating ideas still possible after Auschwitz? Or has Auschwitz shown philosophers complicitous with or, with or their ideas ineffectual in the face of the destruction of human life? If it is indeed still possible, philosophy from the standpoint of damaged life would be anything but innocent. Would be anything but ignorant. But of course, we can continue pretending that nothing happened. But it is not only, possi only possibility of the only the possibility of philosophy that is questioned here. After the fact, borrowing from Espen Hammer, after the fact of industrialized mass murder, any narrative of progress, emancipation, and liberation would sound hollow, and existence as such becomes a real context. Auschwitz has become the very symbol of systemic violence. After Auschwitz, our understanding of the world and our relation with other humans 
have forever altered. It is because history has shown us that indeed Auschwitz can happen. It can happen. Although even the Germans only understood what happened in hindsight. They never, they never understood it fully while it was happening. We must realize that we live in a world where there is a fundamental conflict between traditional sources of human freedom and progress. On the one hand, uh, and, a, and a life that does not live on the other hand. Okay, so, a conflict between traditional sources of human freedom, basically philosophy or religion or whatever narrative, on the one hand, and a life that does not live on the other hand. Okay? So philosophy, for example, philosophy that promises justice, and that how can that philosophy that promises justice respond to an event like Auschwitz? How can a philosopher respond to Auschwitz? Basically, what I'm saying here, how can a philosopher respond to violence? Adorno writes, again from the, from the metaphysics, I quote, in the face of the experiences we have had, not only through Auschwitz, but through the introduction of torture as, per, as a permanent institution and through the atomic bomb, all these things form a kind of con co uh, all these things form a kind of coherence, a hellish unity. In the face of these experiences, the assertion that what is that what it that what is or that what, what has meaning and affirmative character which has been attributed to metaphysics almost without exception becomes a mockery. And in the face of the victims, it becomes downright immoral. End of quote. Basically, I mean, how can you philosophize? You know, how can you <laughs> talk with someone who has gone through uh, an experience like Auschwitz? Okay, how can you philosophize with that person? Okay, how can you dialogue with that person? Okay. All right. Metaphysical, metaphysical, and epistemic violence. What is the meaning of human progress? Polit uh, technological, scientific, uh, political, in the face of violence. What is the meaning of human progress in the face of violence? Can we still maintain the belief that, according to Adorno, all of this will have some kind of purpose? Adorno understands violence not only as a historical or political possibility. Historical or political violence is a byproduct of the promise of metaphysics. In a way, we allow Auschwitz to happen. Okay? Intellectuals allow Auschwitz to happen. Historical or political vi sorry, violence results from a pathologization or of our belief in progress and freedom. Uh, I don't think uh, the Nazis thought that they, what they were doing was anti-freedom anti or anti-progress. Anti they were, actually believed that, you know, well, this is progressive. This is how we can achieve freedom. In other words, thought is itself the very perpetrator of violence. Adorno in Negative Dialectics and in the Dialectic of Enlightenment speaks of the violence Purpose perpetrated by human rationality on nature. Human reason has evolved into a kind of instrumental reason, he says, together with Urkheimer in the dialectic of enlightenment. In negative dialectics, he, said, he says this differently. He says, uh, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase, uh, the history of humanity has been the history from the slingshot to the H-bomb. Violence is the shared space of philosophy, science, religion, and politics. If there's one thing that all these spheres have contributed to, it's violence. In this context, violence is an exclusionary and dominating act. 
physical violence is the other phase of epistemological or metaphysical violence. From a fundamental standpoint, human reason registers in the objects of nature a kind of violent misrepresentation. We live in a rectified world, that is to say, a world wherein our concepts reign over natural objects, including ourselves. We live in a world where, uh, uh, because this is how Adorno defines reification, reification happens when concepts become more real than actual objects. So we live in a world where our, our concepts actually are, are, are given priority over, let's say, real people. Right? Uh, and, 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 and this phenomenon, I mean, it's everywhere. It's happening in, in the academe, it's happening in politics, it's happening in every sphere of our life. Thought, however, for Adorno is dialectical. So, uh, so this is the ambivalence that he has for thought. Thought, on the one hand, uh, 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 Thought can, can, can lead to violence, but thought is also dialectical. He says in negative dialectics, while doing violence to, uh, to the object of its synthesis, our thinking heeds a, po a potential that waits in the object, and it unconsciously obeys the idea of making amends to the pieces for what it has done. In philosophy, this unconscious tendency becomes conscious. In of course. Social and political violence. Uh, this is a rather long quotation from the Minima Moralia. He says, The constantly encountered assertion that savages, blacks, Japanese, are like animals, monkeys, for example, is the key to the uh, pogrom. The possibility of pogroms is decided uh, in the moment when the gaze of a fatally wounded animal falls on a human being. The defiance with which he repels this gaze, after all, it's only an animal, reappears irresistibly in cruelties done to human beings. The perpetrators having again and again to reassure themselves that it is only an animal, because they could never fully believe this even of animals. The mechanism of pathic projection determines that those in power perceive as human only their own reflective image instead of reflecting back the human as precisely what is different. Murder is thus the repeated attempt by yet greater madness to distort, to distort the madness of such false perception into reason. What was not seen as human and yet is human is made a thing so that its steerings can no longer refute the manic gains. And of course, right? The pogrom, of course, is the systematic murder or persecution of an ethnic group like the Jews. Adorno seems to be arguing that violence inflicted on nature, what they refer to in the dialectics of the dialectic of enlightenment as a domination of nature is repeated in social life. In other words, domination of nature causes barbarity in social life. Not as a necessary anthropological constant, but as a result of its rationalization. In other words, the barbaric killing of a fellow of a fellow men is an extension of the killing of animals. The pathological turn is based on the anthropological assumption of the right to live of humans. In other words, if we think, if we consider killing the other or the different, uh, or rather it's easier for us to kill the other if we consider the other as an animal, as a complete other. So it's easier for us, right? Okay, lang yan. Dagadik, hindi na tao yung mga Statements like that. If it's a drug addict, it's not a human being anymore. So it's easier to kill a drug addict. Uh, of course, the situation is more complicated than that. 
more complex than that. Um, all right. The pathological theory is based on the anthropological assumption of the right to live of humans, that is, of civilized men. Here, the natural becomes the opposite of civilized. Whatever is natural is considered dangerous. So if it's natural and it's dangerous, kill it. Uh, that, uh, it seems that it seems for Adorno that the history of civil of, of civilization is precisely uh, the curbing of the natural instinct. The justification it's only an animal is of course illegitimate. However, the violence inflicted on animals must be repeated in human beings in order to brush off the justification's illegitimacy. Okay. Uh, it becomes legitimate if it's repeated and done to human beings. Okay, it's only an animal. It becomes that statement becomes legitimate, becomes more legitimate if we apply it on humans. You will, of course, know where this picture uh, um, came from. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a picture from uh, Guantanamo. Uh, you know what? Uh, okay. yeah. But uh, it, this is an instance of, of how we... we it, 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 an instance of how easy. You know how easy it is for people to kill other people just because they think that the other is an animal? Uh, you know how easy it is? It's as easy as that. Look at the third picture, the last one, the bottom. It's easy, she's even smiling beside the corpse. Okay. I don't, I'm not going to explain this philosophically, or I'm going to comment on it uh, further, because that's precisely my point. You have, you have to look at the picture. You'll have to look at the image. Let the image speak for itself. Philosophy doesn't have any, any response to that. Not right away, anyway. And that's coming from a, a deeply Adornoian perspective. So what can your philosophy, in other words, what Adorno is telling you, or telling us, is, what, so, now, what can your philosophy do? How can your philosophy respond to this? So, uh, perhaps the reason why that, uh, that, that uh, female soldier is very happy taking a, a selfie by end, just a picture, uh, beside the corpse is precisely because the corpse is just an animal. Um, this is not in Guantanamo, this is in, uh, this one is from Guantanamo. Uh, these pictures were taken in Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib. Remember the story, of course. Uh, and, and, lit, and, the, and you can see the first picture. The uh, soldiers actually pull a, use, using a leash to pull the uh, prisoner, like a dog. Okay. All right. So the, the basic uh, the basic point of Adorno is: if we treat other people as animals, it's easier for us to do you know to to to. to basically uh, murder them or, or oppress them. And e easily for us, easier for us, in other words. Uh, uh, it, it, it says that we can go home and sleep peacefully. Because we have already, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't, our, our thought, uh, we, should, we brush aside, in other words, the thought that we, we, we actually um, uh, did something wrong to another human being. Okay, so you know epistemic violence, or even you can even say linguistic violence. Language has something to do with this. You know, when you reconfigure your language in, in such a way, uh, or there's such a way rather of reconfiguring your language, um, uh, or there's a way of reconfiguring your language that will help you make murder or violence easy or, or more acceptable. 
To borrow from Giorgio Agamben, and despite the difference between Agamben and Adorno, there's a tendency in contemporary political institutions to reduce life into what Agamben referred to as bare life, or biological life, in contradistinction to the form or manner in which a life is lived. Uh, bare life is, of course, as can be associated can be associated with uh, the phrase uh, "it's only an animal." Okay. Uh, remember, anything that is natural is dangerous. So, if it's dangerous, then it's easy, it's okay to kill it. Um, the reduction of human life into bare life allows political institutions to proclaim exceptions, what Agamben calls exceptions, during times of crisis, wherein governments or a unit of government assume the power to deny basic constitutional rights. Okay, you are, in other words, when you are accepted, uh, uh, you are not a, you are not considered a human being anymore. You are considered as their life, as, si as simply nature, okay? Chicken, in other words, or swine, Sim uh, basic, uh, simply nature. You know, swine, it's easy to kill a swine. Um, and that will bother you. Uh, for both Adorno and Agamben, nature is viewed as dangerous and therefore must be curbed or controlled by reason. Agamben writes, from his state of exception, I quote, the entire Third Reich can be considered a state of exception that lasted 12 years. In this sense, modern totalitarianism can be defined as the establishment by means of the state of exception, of a legal civil war that allows for the physical elimination not only of political adversaries, but of entire categories of citizens who, for some reason, cannot be integrated into the political system. And, and of course, if it cannot be integrated, it's also easier for us to get rid of them. How? Why is it? Uh, uh, what? How can we integrate them? It depends on the language we're using. But we can use a language that will actually exclude people. And because we use that language. It's easy for us to exclude them. It's easier for us to get rid of them. All right. Another, uh, some more pictures. This is, of course, uh, uh, years ago, uh, in 2009. That's uh, nine years, eight years, right? This is the Maguindanao massacre. Okay. Bear life. Uh, recently, we have had uh, in the news uh, instances of, uh, well, EGK as they call it, major, uh, I have a nuanced position on that, by the way. Um, but uh, the situation is not a black. The situation is not simply black and white, right? The situation is more complex, okay? Uh, it, it, I mean, if uh, someone like Kian uh, De Los Santos, remember Kian, of course, this was just a few months ago, who was brutally, who was brutally killed by police officers, right? Uh, accusing him of, uh, you know, of, a, of being a drug courier. Uh, Sans, uh, uh, I call this um, uh, due process, of course. Uh, but, but what allowed the police officers to shoot at and kill Kian? Because they were even? Because they were naturally even? I think it has something to do with language. It has something to do with the language that they use to, to, to qualify or justify or legitimate uh, um, uh, the, uh, the murder or the killing. And several, several uh, examples, of course. Uh, I, uh, I'm showing here the picture of uh, Horacio, of course, Castillo. 
um, not, a, not a victim of AGK, but also a victim of violence. Again, language has something to do with it. I, I think epistemology has something to do with it. Uh, we, we, I can elaborate on that later on, if you want. But, uh, in his lectures on metaphysics, Adorno writes, I quote, if I say to you that the true basis of morality is to be found in bodily feeling, in, in, in identification with unbearable pain, I am showing you from a different side something which I earlier tried to in, indicate in a far more abstract form. It is that morality, that which can be called moral, that is the demand for right living, lives on in openly materialist motives. The metaphysical principle of the injunction that thou shalt not inflict pain, and this injunction is a metaphysical principle, pointing beyond mere facticity, can, be fi can find its justification only in the recourse to material reality, to corporeal physical reality, and not to its opposite pole, the pure idea and of God. And if I want to interpret that in the context of justice, or injustice, or violence, as philosophers, we are not in the position to talk about justice or injustice. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, the, maybe the Jews would have a better would be rather would be in a better position to talk about injustice, but not us as philosophers. Okay, not us as intellectuals. We are not in the position. To uh, you know, to pontificate on justice or injustice, all right. But what I mean by that is, uh, we need to we need to reevaluate re our language, our philosophical language. Okay, we need to bring our language to and ourselves to the materiality of, of, you know, the phenomenon of violence, okay? Uh, this is a tricky thing though, right? Um, uh, it doesn't mean empathizing with the, with the victims, doesn't mean uh, being victims ourselves, okay? Uh, well, we don't have an answer for that, but, but the thing is that, uh, what Adorno is saying is that um, uh, maybe we can understand this in the context in the in the context of you know of a gradation perhaps. I mean, at least we, we are not in the position because um, uh, even our well-guarded philosophical language fails uh, in front of uh, you know in front of of murder in front of justice. <coughs> I think this is my last slide, no, second to the last. Our Auschwitz. An event like Auschwitz interrupts the calmness of metaphysical thinking, punctures the bubble of reason, and ultimately destroys any epistemic and moral justifications for thought and action we have been here to derive from the silver linings of our philosophical assumptions. As philosophers, we are fond of debating, oh, which, of, uh, which of you has uh, the more uh, convincing argument? Okay. At the end of the day, it's not going to be a, a philosophical argument that can destroy a philosophical argument. It's going to be the materiality of violence. It's going to be an event like Auschwitz that will destroy the validity of an art of a philosophical argument. So the question, going back to the question of Adorno, is poetry still possible after Auschwitz, or is philosophy still possible after Auschwitz? The comfortable bourgeois notion of the good life is put into question, and any hope for a utopia is rendered questionable because it is indifferent to the particularity of suffering. The traumatic memory of the past is something that we have to work through. Here, Adorno is calling out to philosophers, uh, quote, the attitude that everything should be forgotten and forgiven is practiced by those party supporters who committed the injustice. 
Okay, let's go. The people who are telling you forget and forgive are the, the same people who perhaps committed the crime. Let's forget about it. Right? Start anew. All right. Now, I'll stop now. Uh, before I, I uh, stop, I, I'd like to read another quotation from Minimum Moralia, one of my favorite quotations from Adorno, section 29 of the Minimum Moralia. He says, and I'm going to explain further, I want you to experience the, the, the life. Adorno says this, of course, he, he, this, is a, this, is a, this is an inflection from a biblical passage, but the biblical passage has a different context, right? But he says, the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. End of quote. Thank you very much for your patience.